the purpose of this presentation is to talk very big picture about work visa and green card options for professionals. Um, I guess the, you already know a little bit about me. I've worked in the field of immigration law for many years, uh, first as a paralegal and now as an attorney um, for the past 14 years. I am also a state representative in Minnesota, so I help make state level laws, and I'm also a professor. So um, we will start out with an overview of the three tiers of immigration to the United States. Um, these can be divided up into the categories here. So non-immigrant visas, permanent residents or green card holders, and U.S. citizens. So as far as non-immigrant visas go, these are temporary. Um, and they're specific to the purpose for which they were granted. Um, so um, if you're coming on a student visa, you will study. If you're coming on a work visa, generally you'll work for the employer that sponsored you. So they're very specific. Um, in addition, there are restrictions on travel in and out of the United States and also on which family members can work. So those are temporary non-immigrant visas. Um, the next tier is permanent residents. So people who have green cards, as we call them, because they used to be green, they aren't anymore. Um, these are uh, valid indefinitely. Um, they give you flexibility in terms of what you're doing and who you're working for, um, and also travel flexibility. And so once you have a green card, your whole family can work for whoever they want and travel in and out of the United States freely. Um, in addition, um, while it's easier to keep out people on temporary visas or kick them out, um, it is harder to do that once you have a green card. Um, and lastly, the, the top tier is U.S. citizenship. So U.S. citizens can sponsor other relatives for green cards. Um, they don't have any restrictions on any public assistance they might need, um, such as assistance with health care or food. Um, so, so that's important. Um, they cannot be deported. Uh, they can spend any amount of time outside of the United States without ever abandoning their citizenship. Um, and in the United States, we permit citizens to have other citizenships. That's called dual citizenship. Um, other countries don't always allow dual citizenship. Um, but in the United States, we do. So these are the big categories of green cards that we'll be talking about. Um, they are in tiers that we created in 1965 when we decided not to have a system that was, you know, based on race or national origin. Um, instead, we said, um, who are the people coming and how many green cards do we want to allocate in each of those categories? And so um, EB1 stands for employment-based first preference, and that's the top tier. There are three categories of EB1, and we'll talk about two today that are relevant. Um, and I'm going to have my tea because my voice is going. <clears throat> Thank you. Okay, so EB1 uh, or EB11 or EB1A, people call it, that is for aliens of extraordinary ability. And we are going to get into detail. I just wanted to lay out the big categories first. EB12 or EB1B, as it is sometimes called, that's for outstanding professors and researchers. EB2 is a category for advanced degree professionals. And we are going to talk specifically about national interest waivers. And lastly, EB2 for advanced degree professionals and EB3 for professionals and skilled workers can also get green cards based on a labor certification. So the EB1 categories, um, both of these categories are about fitting into enough of the buckets, as I call them. So these are um, the enumerated criteria that you need to show for EB11, you show three, 
for EB12, you show two. So these are awards, publications, prestigious memberships, um, high pay as compared to most people in your field, um, peer review activities, and other criteria that just are indicators that you are famous or fancy. Um, and so, so the EB1 categories are really about like fitting yourself into these categories. Um, and like I said, they're looking at your publications, your prestigious memberships, your salary and things like that. Um, extraordinary immigrants can sponsor themselves. Outstanding immigrants need an offer of a permanent position. Um, so, so just broadly speaking, people without a job offer can still file for their own green card if they are an alien of extraordinary ability. Um, you do not have to be inside the United States to pursue either of these green card categories, but uh, practically speaking, it's easier if you are inside the U.S. and already have an existing relationship with an employer. So national interest waivers are, they look and feel very similar to the EB1 categories, but they are different. Um, they fall under EB2, which is for Indians, or, or sorry, individuals with advanced degrees. Um, the difference between EB1 and EB2, practically speaking, is very minimal if you are not born in India or China. Um, for every other country, there are not so many um, amazing professionals coming that they use up all of the, the available numbers and get what we call backlogged. So, so it is under EB2, but there's no, there's no prize for getting under EB1. EB2 is just as good of a green card. Um, so these are generally for researchers. And it's less about just fitting yourself into the categories and more about providing context for why your work is important, why it is of substantial intrinsic merit, and why we want someone who is the most talented and specialized person doing this job rather than having the person go through a labor market test. And so we call it a national interest waiver because it waives that requirement of a job offer and showing that the employer could not find somebody with the minimal skills to do the job. Um, there are two types of national interest waivers. Um, for researchers, um, that's what I just described. Physicians also can get a national interest waiver if they make a five-year commitment in a medically underserved area. So that is another way to get a green card. Um, you can self-sponsor if you are a researcher. If you are a physician, you can technically self-sponsor, but you are making a five-year commitment to an employer in a medically underserved area. Um, and you do not, again, for, well, for the researchers, you don't need to be inside the US. Um, obviously, if I guess you could get, no, no, a national interest waiver for a physician, you would need to be inside the US. I was trying to get creative on the fly, but no, you'd need to be here. So labor certifications, um, these are when a company or an employer says that they are offering a permanent full-time position and that they cannot find a minimally qualified US worker for the job. Um, and this can be done from inside or outside the United States. Practically speaking, an employer generally isn't going to want to make the investment of time and money for this process if you are outside the country. Um, I have handled cases like that. Um, generally, it's for really desperate employers. <laughs> um, the one I'm working with right now is sponsoring um, a handful of Chinese chefs because they cannot find them in their rural area um, and they really want Chinese chefs. So, um, so you can come based on an offer for an employer you've never worked for, um, but practically speaking, it's hard to find that employer. Um, the employer is required by law to pay a portion of the legal fees for this process. That is approximately $4,000 when you take into account legal fees and costs. Um, and it's a pretty, um, you know, a lawyer will try to make this process as easy for an employer as possible, but it still requires their kind of significant engagement with the process. 
So the reason why you would choose the other categories we discussed, so national interest waiver or the EB-1, is because those categories um, you can do on your own, you can pay for it on your own, and the employer it's just much less of a hassle for them to say, sure, whatever, <laughs> do that. You know, we'll provide a letter saying you're great. Um, so that's the labor certification. So now we're going to talk about non-immigrant visas and it's 1114, so we're doing well. Um, so we're going to go through these specific categories that are the most likely to be relevant options for professionals. Um, the H-1B is for specialty occupation workers. Uh, that is jobs that require at least a specific bachelor's degree in a related field to the position. We will also talk about L-1 intercompany transferees. Um, O-1 aliens of extraordinary ability are very similar to those EB-1 categories we discussed. It's all about the buckets. Um, J-1 exchange visitors, are another option very common for scientists. Um, and lastly, F1 students. So H1Bs, um, these are the most generic and flexible type of work visa for professionals. Unfortunately, they are limited each year to 65,000 um, and another 20,000 for people who have US graduate degrees. So not all graduate degrees, US graduate degrees. Um, and people who have those US graduate degrees are much more likely to get selected for one of those 85,000 total. Um, each year, employers uh, enter a registration and then the immigration service does a lottery. It is truly random and it is a terrible system, um, but it's what we got. Um, there are exemptions to the cap. So universities, do not have to um, get one of those 65 or 85,000. Universities can sponsor people all year round. In addition, nonprofits affiliated with universities also can sponsor um, employees year round. Um, my most common uh, clients in that category are public schools that have student teachers um, come from local universities. Um, and just to emphasize, all nonprofits are not cap exempt. They must also be affiliated with an institution of higher education. Um, and lastly, if you are working for a company or an employer based on the campus of a university, then you um, can also be cap exempt. Um, that's rarer, at least in my experience. Um, the only client I've worked with in that category was a physician working for a for-profit physician's practice group at a university hospital. Um, so that's a little bit more in the weeds than we might maybe needed to go, but just, you know, your run of the mill private company is going to have to file in the spring to be included in the lottery. So if you are looking for a job, that an H-1B would be appropriate for, ideally you would start moving forward with getting an attorney and preparing to register for the cap um, in January. And some people don't get an attorney for the registration, um, but anyway, that's still your timeline. I would say January of each year is when you want an employer to start thinking about this. Um, the degree must be related to the offered position. Um, interestingly, the more high level you get, sometimes this can get tricky because people have, you know, really interesting technical degrees and then they go off and they invent things and have really, you know, interesting, far reaching um, research roles. Uh, but generally, we can get these approved. Um, they were difficult under the Trump administration, but they got sued so many times that the federal courts told them to stop denying our cases unfairly. And so ever since then, it, they've been mostly approved. Um, so um, under the H-1B, spouses generally cannot work. Um, certain spouses of Indian or Chinese nationals subject to those big delays can work, but as a general rule, spouses cannot work. Um, and there is a six year limit on H-1Bs. And so if you start an H-1B job 
you want to be thinking forward to when your employer will sponsor you for a green card. So L1s are for intercompany transferees. They're people who have worked for at least one of the last three years for a related entity abroad. Um, so uh, the employment must be either managerial or executive, um, in which case there is a seven year limit, um, or it can be someone with specialized knowledge, which is a five year limit. Um, there is something called a blanket L for really huge companies generally, and blanket Ls can file for their L visas directly with the consulate. They get to skip the petition to the immigration service. And the reason that this is helpful is that the consulates are much nicer than the immigration service. Um, and if everyone can mute themselves, uh, thank you so much. Um, so, so blanket L's are a different procedure. Otherwise, just like uh, I didn't mention, but the H-1B and the L generally have a petition requirement before you apply for a visa at the consulate. Um, there are no limits on the number of L's per year and L spouses can work. Um, in addition, and I, I think I took this off of, oh, I didn't, I just skipped it. So both H's and L's have something called dual intent. Dual intent means that you are coming on a temporary visa, but you plan to potentially file for your green card, or maybe you're even in the green card process. Um, H's and L's are unique. Every other type of visa does not fully permit immigrant intent or dual intent. So O1s are very similar to the EB1 categories. Um, the main difference is just that they are more easy <laughs> to get. Um, USCIS, the immigration service, can look at an O1 and approve it really easily, and then look at the EB1 with the same evidence and you know, send a horrible request for additional evidence or a denial. So, um, so they're similar, but you don't have to be quite as extraordinary. Um, notably, there is a different set of buckets for artists and entertainers than there is for everyone else. And so if you are a musician um, or an artist of any kind, the O1B category is actually much looser and freer and vague and easier to get than if you're an extraordinary scientist or an extraordinary athlete or business professional. Um, but in general, O1s are attainable. Um, if you have some publications and citations, maybe some non-academic awards like, um, you know, best poster presentation at a conference or something like that, um, they are, they are you know, they are attainable, um, even if you are not a Nobel Prize winner. Um, there are no limits on the number of O's per year. Spouses of O's cannot work. Um, and they are granted for three years initially, and then they are granted one year extensions, generally speaking. Um, they do not allow that immigrant intent, although there are some nuances to that that I won't get into. But, um, but just generally speaking, they're not allowed immigrant intent. I'm going to drink my tea. Okay, um, so J1s are exchange visitors. Um, generally, um, people coming here for residencies through the Educational Commission on Foreign Medical Graduates are going to come on a J1. Um, research scholars, trainees, and interns are also categories of J1s. Um, there is something called a two-year home residence requirement for Js. Um, and these apply for people who got graduate medical education, such as a residency, um, people who are on what's called the skills list, and people who received government funding from their government or the United States. Um, the skills list is a list that every country in the world is allowed to create that says who they want back. So if they really care about their biologists, but they really don't really care if they get their geologists back, like they get to make the list. Um, there's a bunch of codes, but basically each country can say, these are the professionals who we really do want to come back for a couple of years before they would be eligible for the green card or another type of status. Um, 
So the two-year home residence requirement, if it applies, can either um, be fulfilled by going home for two years and coming back, um, or there are certain types of waivers. And I don't think I'll get into too much detail here, but if you are afraid that you'll be persecuted, um, if you go back, or if you have a US citizen or permanent resident family member, and you're afraid um, that it will cause them unique hardship, if you were to go back or if they were to go with you for two years, um, that's another way that you can get around this requirement. Um, and for physicians, they can also make a three-year commitment in a medically underserved area. And we really like it when they do that. Um, and I think it's one of the most brilliant aspects of American immigration law is that we're meeting our healthcare needs through our immigration. And I would love to see that done like in so many other realms. Um, so that's the two-year home residence requirement. Um, be aware of this because it's super annoying if you realize that you found like your dream job or you marry a US citizen and you want to file for your green card, but you've got this two-year requirement. So just know that J's, like I have in my bullet points, they're relatively easy to get because you don't have to do most of the work. Um, but if you do have that two-year requirement, it can be tricky. Um, they do not allow dual intent, so you must have the plan initially to return. Uh, spouses can work on J. And just to confirm, when I say spouses can work, I mean that as of right now, they would have to apply for a work card. Um, there's some talk about like creating, changing the regulations so that their work authorization is just inherent in their status. But for now, what would happen is they would come in and they would apply for a work card. And then once the card arrives, then they can work. Um, but that's only an option for certain types of statuses that we have discussed. Um, the F1 is for students. It is for a full-time course of study. Uh, employment is something that I assume everyone is interested in. So I focused on that here. Um, you can work on campus for 20 hours as part of an F1 status. There is also something called CPT, or Curricular Practical Training. Um, CPT allows you to work uh, for credit as part of your degree program. Uh, OPT, or Optional Practical Training, is one year of work authorization after you graduate. For people who have a STEM degree in science, technology, engineering, or math, they can work for an additional two years after that. Um, and I didn't mention it here, but if you come to the United States and then there's something um, that creates unexpected financial hardship, you can also be eligible for work authorization that is you know, specific to your situation. And it has to arise after you get here. Um, and F2 spouses cannot work. Um, so that was like 26 minutes. Um, would you like to ask questions or I can kind of go back and see where I can fill in additional details? Thank you so much, Sandra, for this great presentation. For our uh, audience, because I'm, I'm sure there are many people having this question, um, will they be able to practice and work uh, as a medical doctor in the United States with, I mean, holding these qualifications from overseas? Foreign physicians will come to the United States on a J-1 visa um, as a foreign medical graduate to complete a residency um, or a fellowship. Um, and so as part of that, they would be authorized. Um, to get an H-1B, which is generally the next type of work visa that they would move into once they complete their training, they would need to show that they are licensed to practice medicine. So they need to take the USMLE steps one, two, and three, generally speaking, in order to be, well, no, for sure, to be ordered, to be eligible for an H-1B. Um, interestingly, some states only require USMLEs one and two, um, but, but for um, H-1B eligibility, you do need to have completed your board exams. 
um, in order to be eligible. And I have had clients who like had, they did like a second fellowship in the United States, just because it was an easier path to becoming a fully licensed physician in the United States. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Sandra. I appreciate it, really. That was a great talk. Uh, so just to clarify, for those who don't speak English, you can ask your question in Kurdish and I'll translate it for you. Uh, uh, yeah, Hushyar, please go ahead and ask your question. Oh, thank you so much. And thank you, Sandra, for your um, great presentation. I have a question regarding the people uh, that they may have other citizenship. Like, for example, I'm coming from New Zealand and I have a New Zealand citizenship, but I wanted to apply for um uh, postdoc in uh, US um so I was I was wondering what would be the situation uh, do I need a visa or I can I'm mean, like the uh, resident of the, the visa I mean the resident visa to to work there as a postdoc or still I can use my current uh, citizenship so I was wondering what is the situation or maybe you can help me with final a uh, little bit more about it thank you so much yeah um, so, so your citizenship won't be a factor in what visa you're eligible for. Um, and the visa to come as a postdoc um, typically is um, going to be an F1 student visa, although you could also come as a research scholar on a J1. Um, generally, the process would be that you would apply at a US institution. Um, and once you have an opportunity, you would work with their international students department or students services um, to process the paperwork for both an F student visa and a J exchange visitor visa. The school will issue a document to you and that document will be the basis for your visa application. And so as a citizen in New Zealand, you would come from New Zealand um, you'd apply for your visa at that consulate and then come here as a temporary worker. Um, eventually, you might file for your green card. And after that, eventually you might file for United States citizenship. And it's at that point that the rules in New Zealand will let you know if that means you might lose your citizenship in New Zealand or if you can keep both. I don't know off the top of my head anything about New Zealand's rules around dual citizenship. Um, I think that Australia doesn't allow dual citizenship, um, but I'm not sure about that, honestly. So don't quote me on that, I'm not sure. Um, but, um, but the citizenship won't come into play um, when you're looking at postdoc opportunities. And I see I had a question in the chat that I can answer as well, yeah. Um, so um, Binar wanted to know, can I apply for a university in the United States? Um, and, and the answer is yes. And then once you're admitted as a student, you would work with the school and they would then issue, um, in, in that case, the I-20 is um, the form that they issue for you to apply for an F-1 student visa. Um, and then Diaco said, um, Oh, oh, you're asking, oh, I thought you were talking yeah, about I just, okay. Yeah, I just, I just wanted yeah. to see if the question can be more, it was a bit general, I thought it, they may want to put it in the context of immigration. So, um, yeah, I have a couple of uh, other people wanting to ask, and then I have a list of questions that people have sent me separately here. Um, so let, let's go to Mr. Masood Kerimi. Please um, ask your question, Masood. Destination uh, slow is Bova, Binarin Wawa, Mewaniwa, as Masud Tehronima, as Basha Naftu in a Jida the Habitim, Men Daroka Bachelor here, Balaman Tajrubo experience on Mia Naftu Gaz here, Chebano Metaibat, Bo immigration, a Hana Bo Basha Naftu Gazi. Is there any specific program for oil and gas uh, workers? Um, do you mean like engineers or do you mean people yeah. who work? Yeah. 
Um, there's no specific program, but a company could sponsor you for an H-1B if you have a related degree. And most likely it would be a cap subject H-1B. So it would be filed under the lottery, which means that ideally you would want to have a job offer lined up by January so that they could be ready to submit the registration for the H-1B lottery. If you're famous, you could look at an O-1 as well. Like if you're published articles about your field and won awards, or maybe have really important leadership roles with your current employer, um, you could look at an O-1 also, but the most obvious visa option will be an H-1B. Right. If there is no more question here, I can read my, the question that I have here. Can I have one more quick question, please? Go ahead, please. Thank you. Uh, Sandra, you beautifully explained the temporary visas. Thank you so much for that. And uh, the categorization was very good. Uh, here is a very um, simple question. Which one of these temporary visas, I mean, the temporary visa holders, can convert their visas to a permanent visa, or let's say holding a temporary visa, they, they are eligible or they're able to apply for a permanent visa. So anyone can always file for a green card, whether they're here on a work visa or they're outside the United States. In terms of which of these visas most easily transitions to a green card, I would say that the H-1B and the L1 categories, which allow dual intent. So you can have that intention from the beginning and the whole time. Um, they are the easiest type of visa to have when you want to file for a green card. But any one of these categories could transition to a green card. Including student visa. Yes, um, if it's a student visa, then there, most of these categories, I would tell people not to travel outside of the United States at a certain point in the process. But the question of immigrant intent is about your intention on your last entry into the United States. And so if your last entry was a year ago, and now you're starting the green card process, that is totally fine. But I wouldn't want you to leave and come back again because because at that point, you already really do have that immigrant intent. Um, so if you're not in an H or an L, there is some different timing strategies and restrictions on travel, but you can move from any of those classifications to green card. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. So I have a sort of related question here that someone asked about the order of applying for different visas. For example, um, people um, apply, let's say someone applies for a green card and then decides to come to United States as a visitor. Uh, would that affect the permanent residency application? So they started the green card process and then want to come as a visitor. Yeah. So um, there's mostly a... Sorry? Yeah, a visitor or a student or any type of other visas, basically. There are always kind of delicate considerations around what status you're in when you enter and if you want to file for a green card. And so for all of these, there's not like a black and white rule. So for example, I have had clients in the middle of the green card process who entered the United States as visitors or on student visas. Um, sometimes there are um, strategic pathways we need to take to make sure that their travel is not a problem. Um, sometimes it's about the category of green card. So for example, if you are sponsored um, by a, a sibling, a brother or sister, um, or if you're the adult son or daughter of a U.S. citizen, in those family-based green card categories, there are huge delays and so just because I might be eligible in 10, 15 years to get a green card doesn't mean that right now I can't enter as a student or a visitor um, because I'm not even eligible yet to file for the green card. Um, that said, it's oftentimes more of a practical 
challenge. So if you're in the middle of the green card process and your F1 visa is expired and you really wanted to travel, um, you know, you could have problems at the consulate or at the port of entry if that comes up. Um, so, so there are, like, I would say that this question, if I were advising, it would be on a case by case basis because every case is a little bit different. Um, but there is no rule that says that you can't travel as a visitor or a student while you're in the green card process. It's about convincing the consulate or the port of entry that you understand the rules around immigrant intent. I see, great. And then we have a question from K1 here. Are spouses able to educate there? Would it be possible? Probably, um, I guess, depends on which visa type, right? Yeah. Um, they just changed the rules for F1s, like just. <laughs> And so for all of the other classifications, they can be full-time students, that, the ones that we discussed. So H spouses, L spouses, J spouses, they can all, and O spouses, they can all be full-time students. Um, I'm, I'm like 98% sure that they just changed the rules so that F2 spouses of F1 students, I believe that they have to get an F1 visa now. But, but the rule is, is very new. So if you are coming on an F and you have a spouse and you're wondering, you can reach out to me and I will find out for sure for you. Perfect. In fact, the question was exactly about F1. So, <laughs> so that's cool. good. <laughs> they, if they want to e email me, I can find out for sure. Cause like the rule just changed. Perfect. So, K1 to 20, Brasta, who emailed me, she was Sandra, Savarago, F1 visa, AR, Matipeka. Uh, all right, we have uh, a question here about O1, about the timing of that, and what is really the difference between that and e EB1? I mean, can educated people also apply for this and also for the labor certificate, or is it a different category? I mean, what is the what are the main differences, really, people, uh, or at least this this person has um, hasn't totally understand it. Yeah, so the difference between EB1 and O1, was that part of the question? Uh, the difference between O1 and EB1 or yeah, EB2. So, yeah, so O1 is a temporary visa and mm -hmm. EB1 or EB2 or labor certification is a green card category. And so you have to, if you're inside the United States, you'll have a temporary status, um, presumably. And that is separate from your green card eligibility or a green card process. And so the most common path is that you come, for example, on an O, and then once you're here, you start a green card process, maybe an EB1. The O1 and the EB1, like I said, they're very similar. And so the O1 will allow you to work in the US. The EB1 will allow you to indefinitely work and travel to and from the US forever. The O1 is valid for three years and then one year at a time after that. So that's the difference. Okay, and perfect. And then the labor certification is a green card path as well. Okay, and then labor certification, the uh, question is, is it for all educated people or for, uh, for other careers? Yeah, so labor certifications generally are under EB2 or EB3 category for uh, advanced degree professionals or for um, professionals or unskilled workers. So jobs requiring at least two years of experience. So I've done labor certifications for doctors, Chinese chefs, architects, lots and lots of computer professionals, um, anything you can think of, a lot of like marketing professionals, um, any job that requires some basic skills and experience and qualifications that the employer cannot find in the United States would qualify for a labor certification. And it's Fantastic. easier. So like if you're looking at the EB1 versus the labor certification, the labor certification might be the more obvious path. Um, the reason why people choose EB1 or a national interest waiver is because you don't need an employer sponsor. And so, you know, they take more work on your end. The labor certification takes more work on the employer's end. 
And so sometimes it's hard to get the employer to do that, even if it is the most obvious path. Perfect. And then there is a question. The last question is about L visa. Um, is it an exchange visa? So people who work in a company that has an office in the United States can um, can uh, use this visa type or, or it's something else? So um, most L's are going to be for somebody who's transferring to the U.S. They were, say, a manager abroad. They're going to come and manage things here. Or they were um, an expert in the product and they need to come to the U.S. to like help train other employees in that expertise and help work from within the United States operations. Um, they can be here for a short period of time. Um, there is something called an H3 trainee visa. And so I would probably go L if I could, just because it's slightly easier than an H3. Um, so sorry, some appointment just popped up close. Um, so, so yeah, so there are, are options for trainees under the J or the H3. Um, L's generally aren't for people coming for like a really short amount of time. Um, that said, if it's a really, really big company and they have that blanket L, then it's easier for them to just have you go to the consulate. And so they might do it that way. Um, I, I, I can't think of any trainees I've brought in on an L. Okay, perfect. So it is really just for experts who work in industry in a country outside the United States and their expertise is required by companies or by um, research institution in the United States. So they come in uh, to provide expertise, but uh, it doesn't have to be from um, an international company that has offices in both countries. That was the question. Oh, yeah, it does. And L must have companies abroad or a company abroad. So, um, so a company like, that has it that has a has an office also in has a branch in United States. Yes. So they need to have a company like a physical like a, a corporate presence in the United States, as well as outside of the United States. And then okay. the person needs to be employed outside of the United States for at least one year in the three years before they are sponsored. And so um, it needs to be a, an office, branch, affiliate, subsidiary, or parent company. Um, and they need to have that corporate relationship in order to have somebody transfer from their foreign company to the US entity. Perfect. Yeah. And um, just so that you know, I'm getting some questions in chat and I'm yeah. not going to be able to multitask and answer questions and also type answers. But if the people who sent me messages in chat want to send me an email, I would be happy to follow up. I'm just going to put my email in chat. Um, I just feel like I can't separate my attention out quite that well. But, um, okay. but the, there are two people who sent me a message. Feel free to send me, or maybe I can answer one of these questions quickly. Um, is it possible to extend the J-1 for another internship during the first internship in the United States? Um, I. There, it is, I believe, um, J1s do have specific time limits per, or like um, they have very specific rules per category. And off the top of my head, I'm not sure if you can do two internships in a row, but I believe you can. And so um, the, the place to go for that question would generally actually be the company interested in offering you the internship. Um, and they can work with their attorney to find out the exact answer. Um, I would need to look at the big picture of somebody's past J history and then the specific category rules in order to advise. And there are enough rules and subcategories in J that I don't know them off the top of my head because oftentimes an attorney is not involved um, because the, the programs can work directly with the government. Um, so I, I can't answer that J question any more specifically than that. Um, and then for the other question, I think somebody can, you can send me a chat about citizenship and green cards. So. Okay, perfect. So if you have like a couple of more minutes, Sandra, we have a number of questions uh, in Instagram. 
and that uh, Ayub will be reading them to you, just two of them. Yeah, if we can take questions, that would be great. So yeah. one question is from Dr. Moradiani. She's asking about the talent visa. I'm not sure which category this one uh, is belonging to. So the question is, um, if people apply for talent visa, are they able to apply for any type of working visa at the same time? So um, there's no talent visa. I think she might be referring to the O-1. And the O-1, it does have some flexibility built in, but you need to structure it that way. You need to be very specific in structuring it to allow flexible employment. Um, and it would, it would very much depend on the specifics on whether that is possible. Um, but I have been able to get flexibility in a lot of different types of O-1 cases. So it is possible. And if you do it that way, then you don't need other, like you can't have two visa types at a time. So, but you could use your O to work for multiple employers. Um, but it's it's very specific to how you structure your O-1 at the beginning. Uh, thank you so Wait, much. There's one more question here. Um, she's asking about uh, people having doctorate degree in genetic um, I mean, married people, which type of visa is the best for them to apply for? I mean, it sounds like somebody who might get a job with a university that sponsors them for an H1. Um, they could be a research scholar who comes on a J1. Um, the benefit of the J1 is that the spouse can work. Um, so I would look at those two options. It may be that an O1 is also possible. Um, if they have publications, maybe they've done peer review activities, like reviewing articles for journals, um, awards, things like that. So an O-1 may also be an option there. Um, I would say that the H-1B, like all things being equal, if I could choose one, I would want to be the H um, because it allows that dual intent and it's just more straightforward and there's no possibility of a two-year home residence requirement, which the J has, potentially has. Thank you so much, Sandra. Mm -hmm. Perfect, thank you very much. I'm sure there'll be a lot more questions. So uh, I just want to thank you once more, Sandra, for uh, giving such a great presentation. And uh, I'm sure you'll be bombarded with lots of emails. <laughs> and I believe that there has been a link created in the, in the Zilemo's website. And through that, people can also ask their questions. And if you log in, uh, we also have a mobile uh, application uh, for Zilemo. You may want to use that if that, that's more uh, easy for you. Cool. Thank you very much again, Sandra, and thanks everybody for attending today. Das the kanta zof poshbe bo wey amroh zuf abu kat sate ki zof poshtambe. Have a great time, uh, everybody, and um, see you next time. Thank you very thanks. much, Sandra. Yeah, my pleasure. This was fun. Thank Have a good day. Bye bye. Thanks. Okay, bye.